Welcome to the Holy Spirit's Curriculum of Joy podcast. My name is Juanico Overhuber and I'm your host. My guest today is Anna Hendricks. Hello and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So, I'm so happy to have you here and... I would like to start with a question that I ask all first-time guests. How did you come to see the world the way you do today? Yeah, so I've actually been thinking about this question when I was researching your podcast and listening to how other folks shared and answered. And it's a pretty big question, quite frankly. (laughs) I was like, okay, so how do I... I mean, this is my life story. It's my life journey, you know, to encapsulate it in a few minutes is, is pretty tough. I think some folks did it really well. I'm going to do my very best. Um, you know, I was, I was really born. You don't into have life. to encapsulate it into a few minutes. You can take as much time as you like. It's oh, it's all good. Choice how long? You yeah. Take. Well, we would be here all day if I was to truly dive into it. <laughs> um, Yeah. So I was born into this lifetime knowing God. And for me, God is love. It's not tied to any type of religion. Um, But I was born into this lifetime knowing God. And I did grow up in a Christian home. That was very much the backdrop of the way in which I viewed the world. Although at a very young age, I realized quickly that I disagreed with a lot of the things I saw in church the ways people treated one another. There were just a number of different things that really hit me very wrong, but I didn't go to church and I wasn't in love with my Bible or any of those things for anything other than the fact that I was very much in love with God and loved speaking with God and communicating. And I was fortunate in that I grew up in a non-denominational church. And so I saw some pretty interesting things growing up. You know, I saw angels. I saw the laying on of hands and people being healed immediately. I grew up around people speaking in tongues and just a number of things that your typical, you know, person who grew up in the Christian faith didn't necessarily experience. And for me, you know, as I grew older, my relationship with God really changed and evolved and it grew based upon, you know, the many different things that I was going through in life. And God really showed his, which is just the pronoun I use, um, the ways in which he wanted to show up for me were just consistent, always there. It was like I had somewhere to go regardless of what it was that was going on in my life. And it gave me a strong confidence in life to try things and to push the limits and to go further. My relationship with God continued to evolve as I grew older. It changed and, you know, it would come together and expand. And I can say that, like, I've never been someone who, um, you know, God for me was never a question, like whether or not God existed, but how God existed or the ways in which God worked with us, these sorts of things were questions that would keep me up at night. I was really curious. I wanted to know more. I've always sought to understand God, to understand the world around me. Um, that's just a part of who I am. And uh, regardless of what happens to me in life, it'll always be who I am. But um, in 2018, I was currently the CEO of a marketing agency, and I had also built a second business, a retail business on the side. And within this business, it really held my, a part of my purpose. And I had always been someone who was searching for my purpose. And I really felt like in this business, I had, had found a piece of it. Um, but we were far in advance in regards to technology and what was available. And after about two years, I had to shut that down at the very end of 2018. That was the most devastating event that I have experienced, you know, to that point in my life, because again, I was someone who had been searching for purpose my whole life. Um, And right about the same time, I decided to join a group of friends for a 90 day no drinking challenge. And, you know, I wasn't an alcoholic, but I had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. I love drinking alcohol. I think it was a way for me to deal with life, to get through life. 
for a large part of my life, I think I was pretty bored. You know, I wasn't ever the type of person to go to school and then go get married and have kids. That's just, that's, I have been very non-traditional in that way. I've always been looking for more. Alcohol helped me to chill the F out and kind of come down to earth and be able to be relaxed and be centered and be with people and, you know, just, just chill. Um, but that sort of combination of like the biggest heartbreak of my life till that point mixed with, you know, sobriety really kind of blew the hinges off of the doors to my spirituality. And I call it my metaphysical awakening because I've always been a very spiritual person. But um, all of a sudden, the ways in which I viewed the world just like expanded greatly. And I mean, it happened very, very quick. Within that first month, I was questioning everything. By the third month, I was like a completely different person, open to different things I had never been open to within the physical, within the new age. I was searching and seeking and diving into all kinds of things. And I promised myself early on that my guiding light in the midst of my discovery would be love. Because of course, that is the foundation of who I am. It's the foundation of my beliefs. You know, it's who I believe God to be. And so I felt like regardless of what I came into contact with, if I felt it was founded in love, then I would be safe and I would be aligned. Um, and throughout 2019, I was diving into all kinds of different modalities. I was trying stuff on. I was doing healing courses. I was doing intuitive courses. I was, I was doing a number of different things. Um, but, uh, you know, all just for fun's sake, I had no, no intention of like ever doing this kind of work at any point in time. Um, it was just for my own curiosity. And because it was like, I was in a brand new world all of a sudden. And towards the end of 2019, I came across the words Akashic Records. And for me, it felt like one of those Hollywood moments where time stops and I felt at home. And yet, because of my background and where I was at, I really couldn't conceptualize it. I didn't understand what it was. It felt very like far out and esoteric for me. And so I just thought, okay, and I put it aside and it continued coming up, coming up, coming up all over the place over the next couple of months. Um, at the beginning of 2020, I decided to pick up uh, Linda Howe's How to Read the Akashic Records book. There was like an ad that had popped up on Facebook. And I'm like, you know, not the type of person to click on an ad. But I thought, all right, let me give this a shot. I'm curious. It arrived on a Saturday morning. I had read three fourths of it by the afternoon. And then that Monday when my partner went to work, I went into the Akashic Records for the first time. And it's difficult to kind of explain what it was that I experienced when I did that, but I knew that it was going to completely shift my life. It was different. It opened me up. It felt, it felt very familiar and yet completely foreign. And I booked uh, an Akashic reading with a reader shortly after that, because I was very curious to understand what this was, to understand what was going on. And she shared with me that, you know, I have been working in the Akashic records for many, many lifetimes and that it would play a very big role in this particular lifetime. Um, that was all cool and well, but again, I was the CEO of a marketing agency at this point in time and pretty, pretty definite about the path I was going to be walking. And then, of course, the pandemic happened and things really started shifting in my life very quickly. By that, uh, by that fall, my guide started coming in and sharing with me that I was going to become a spiritual guide. And to be very blunt with you, I had zero interest in it. I just wasn't, you know, it was like talking about marketing is way easier at cocktail parties. I had just no interest in doing this work. In fact, the book that I had read, the only part of the book that I read was about how to read for yourself, like not even how to read for others. Um, it just, it wasn't something I was interested in, but step by step, they started, you know, they had me start creating like monthly forecasts for my podcast. They had me reading for other people for practice towards the end of the year. They were like, you're going to start charging now. And about that time, I really started tantruming very, very hard and just doing everything I could to put it away, to step away from it. Um, but of course, it kept coming back, kept coming back. My guides, you know, they, they weren't pushy in the process, but they were just like, look, 
this is, this is your destiny. This is what you're going to be doing. And so you can suffer and try and go in the opposite direction, or you can like, just trust us. And, um, and so by February of 2021, I decided to throw it up on my website. I told them it was completely up to them. And, um, and they have taken me on quite a wild ride. The Akasha has played an enormous role. And, and part of the reason I tell you this whole story is because the Akasha has played such an enormous role in regards to how I view the world now, the ways in which I look around at other people, the compassion that I have, the understanding. I just went to a funeral on Friday for a very old friend of mine who I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to. And, you know, instead of being devastated or heartbroken, I was celebrating the fact that, you know, he had spent a lifetime struggling with his body. He was born with some defects and had gone through a number of surgeries. And so I was celebrating the fact that I knew he was out of his body, that he was now free and moving on to that next part. Um, you know, the ways in which I see the view, the ways in which I see the world wouldn't be possible without the Akasha because I've been able to not only within my own Akashic records, but in doing readings for others and doing energy work and healing within the Akashic records, I've been able to see things that, you know, that, that you only dream about that you maybe see in movies. Um, and that a lot of people don't believe yet. And I didn't believe at the beginning of this either. Um, it has been a very wild ride and I'm so thankful for every step along the way. Wow. So let's look at the, the idea or the background of what the Akasha is or how that feels to you because it had such a profound meaning in your life, has such a profound meaning in your life and has helped you in so many ways and has also given you tools to help others, if I understand correctly. Would you like to explain that a little more? Yeah, absolutely. I love explaining the Akashic Records. So first of all, I think the easiest way for anyone to just grasp a hold of what the Akashic Records are is to think about like Apple Cloud, Google Cloud, right? When we, we have information and we store it in these places, we, we don't really see it. We don't really know where it's at. We just know it's somewhere. So when we need to go get some photos or some audio, whatever the case may be, we can go in these clouds and we can grab it and pull it out. And that is exactly how the Akasha works. So first of all, everything is energy, right? Like everything is energy. Like the wall is energy. My desk is energy. I'm energy. But we're all vibrating at different frequencies, of energy. And the Akasha is energy itself. And the Akasha exists all around us, but it exists at such a high frequency that it's actually in a different dimension. Everything, because it is energy, has an Akashic record. And when we use the word record, it's basically just sort of like a Western way of understanding that there's a history attached to everything that has ever been in existence past, present, or future. The Akasha has a record of it. And when I step into the Akashic records, I am able to access information past, present, and future for whatever thing, place, person I'm access accessing it for. Within the Akashic records, you can, I mean, it's, it's basically learning how to communicate with energy and learning how to operate your own energy so that you're able to do that. You also mentioned guides that came in and showed you this is your path, this is what you need to do, and, and insisted without being rude about it, but insisted that you go deeper with it. Would you like to share about your guides or do you want one of them to come through or more of them to come through? It's up to you. Yeah, no, my guides. So first of all, there are guides that I work with within the Akashic Records and then there are guides that are with me in my everyday. And these are two different types of guides. So typically 
And I teach people how to access the Akashic Records as well. Um, but typically when you access the Akashic Records, you are working with the masters, teachers, and loved ones, whomever they are, they step forward for you. Usually you do not see who these guides are. They typically stay in the dark. And that's specifically because they do not want you to become emotionally dependent upon them. Because within the Akasha, I mean, exists the highest form of information possible. It is neutral. It has no prerogative. It is simply there for you to access. So it's very important to not become emotionally attached to your guides within the Akashic Records. In addition, those guides are coming in and out depending upon maybe the topic that you're asking about or whatever it is that's going on, maybe different periods of your life. These masters, teachers, and loved ones are continuously, you know, they're very interchangeable. The guides that I have in my everyday life, I have a lot of guides in my everyday life. They come in and they go out as well. But I have some very main guides in my life. Um, Jesus is a main guide. I have Archangel Raphael. Um, and uh, those are the like the main ones I work with. I work with Archangel Michael. There's a lot of different guides that I work with. Um, but the guides that are, I also have a guy named Star. And Star is probably with me the most. Um, but my guides, you know, my guides are consist like one of the things that I learned on my journey with learning how to read the Akashic Records and really strengthening my skill and sharpening my ability to channel was that I had always had an open channel running through me. Always. I thought it was me that was bringing forward all of this information. And at the same time, I knew that it wasn't me, but I didn't have the language in which to articulate it. I didn't understand it. A lot of people have this sort of ability to access information that they don't even necessarily know per se, and be able to answer a question that is like being in flow with your higher self, being in flow with the information that's flowing through you. I've always been someone that people come to with questions, wanting direction, wanting guidance. That's always been my role. Even when I was a kid, adults would come to me and they would ask me for information and I would spout something off and they'd walk away and I would just be like, what the, how did I even know anything about that? I knew that I was acting as sort of a middle component to everything that was going on. And, you know, in the midst of learning how to read the acoustic records and really fine tune that, that's been part of my processes, realizing that I'm consistently accessing that information. It's open and available to me here. So I call in and welcome in my guides, only those acting in my highest and best with me every single morning. It's a part of my ritual. It's a part of what I do. Um, and therefore, they are able to communicate with me throughout the day when I need that sort of guidance. And so, you know, they will let me know like, oh, this is the next project you should work on today. Or maybe this is someone that you should reach out to or, you know, and it's not this sort of connection where. Um, I've got very strong boundaries in place in regards to who can connect with me. And so it's not like I've just got like beings and, and spirits like talking to me throughout the day. That's that's not happening. Um, they only step in when it's in my highest and best for them to do so. So I have strict boundaries in place, but um, I'm very connected with my spiritual self and really have to kind of work harder to be more human <laughs> in my 3D than than vice versa. So what does this accessing feel like for you? Because I'm not going to, unless you want to, you can access something. But the the idea is what does it feel like to you and what is the purpose of it because you were sharing a lot about how it's up uh, it's supposed to be in the highest interest and so on but what does that mean for you because you were speaking also you were speaking of love as the your definition of god being love and so on so there must be a, a deeper meaning that you are gaining when you access this whole akashic record the the, the feeling of the presence of love in your life and all these things that go with what you're speaking of or come with it, yeah. The Akasha is, the way that I view the Akasha, 
is that it is God energy. And because it is so high frequency, simply being in the Akasha is healing to the body, mind, to the soul. I can tell you that when I have weeks where I'm spending a lot of time in the Akashic records, I'm the most nice, chill, laid back person. And over the past several years of working in the Akasha, I have healed at such a deep level in regards to my temperament, the ways in which I show up for people, the ways in which I view the world. It has expanded greatly because I've been given so much ability to to see so many layers deep in regards to what life is about, what this human experience is about, you know, why people play certain roles in our lifetime. When I'm in the Akasha, it's a very multi-sensory experience for me. I'm seeing, hearing, feeling, knowing at the same time. And also I'm able to view information in a very telepathic 3D type of way. So, you know, you and I are 2D right now, right? We're just one-on-one. -on -one. We just see this and this is what's happening. But when I'm in the Akasha, one image can show up and it can, and I will automatically understand 20 layers deep of what that means. And so the information that comes through for me, it comes in in a varied range. When I'm in my own Akashic records, I'm primarily hearing and seeing a little bit, but primarily hearing. But when I go into the Akashic records for other people, I am accessing and communicating with their guides. And so I experience the Akasha through their strongest senses, you know, hearing, feeling, knowing, seeing. So sometimes with a client, it will be very visual. And other times I won't see anything at all. It varies. You know, um, I'm sure that you've had people on this show share with you, like, we're all psychic. We're all intuitive. We all have all of the gifts, but they vary in regards to their strength. You know, they're, they're muscles that um, we haven't worked out. And so we have to get to know them and to use them. Um, some of the reasons that I access the Akashic Records, you know, for myself personally, I love doing weekly forecasts. I love sitting down at the beginning of the week and asking like, okay, what do I need to know about this week? You know, what, what are some challenge that, challenges that might arise What what so that I can get my mind straight? Um, I ask about my business. I utilize the Akasha with my business, with my relationships, with my health, with everything, honestly. Um, they are like being able to work within the Akasha is such a blessing for that reason. You know, I'm never, I'm never without somewhere to go and somewhere to ask. Um, and with my clients, I mean, it, it ranges across the board in regards to, you know, a lot of folks come in because they want to understand their life. They want to understand their purpose, what it is that they're here doing. Um, a lot of folks are in the midst of a big um, crossroads in their life and they're not really sure what's going on um, or things are really falling apart in their life. Other folks come to me because they want to understand their family dynamics or their relationship, you know, with their partner, um, what's going on within their career. I mean, you, the sky is literally the limit. Like there is no limit when it comes to the amount of information that you can receive in the Akashic record. So when you access the Akasha, you have to be very intentional. You have to bring questions. You have to know why you're there. Because unlike when like a psychic or a medium opens up their channel and information just starts pouring through, when you open up the Akashic records, everything exists there. And so they're not going to just chunk stuff at you. You want to ask them information and then they can bring that forward for you. Um, it's a very different experience in that way. So what's really cool, again, is like everything is energy. So everything has an Akashic record. So you can like access the Akashic Records for your house. You can find out what energy is there, how it's serving you, maybe how it's challenging you, you know, the lessons it's teaching you. Um, you can access the records for a country if you're thinking about moving somewhere. Um, the two caveats here when accessing the Akashic Records is it has to be yours, meaning you have to own it, or you have to have permission if it is not yours. So things that are within the public domain, like a country or something like that, you can access the records for. But just like all modalities, there is an ethical component and you cannot infringe upon someone else's Akashic records just to learn about them or to get information about them. Um, there's, there's like 
there's chatter within the spiritual community about people being able to access someone else's Akashic records without their permission, but it's just flat out not possible. The Akasha will not open up for someone else. Um, but, you know, if you have a pet and they're not feeling well, man, open up their Akashic records. It is good to ask first and they'll let you know if they want it or not. Um, but then you can find out what's going on with them, how to take care of them. And this isn't just like flowery information. This is like practical, real, helpful, useful information. Um, even though I've always been a spiritual person, I am a very practical person. And so while, you know, some of the like wooey stuff is fun, I don't have any use for it if I can't utilize it in my everyday, if it can't help me to proceed forward in my life, if they can't give me practical steps for how to build my business, how to improve my health, how to, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and one of the things I love the most about the Akashic Records is that they will not tell you what to do. They're not interested in that. And so you can ask a question and they will give you all of the information and context about that particular situation. And then they will hand it back to you to make for you to make a choice. Because the ultimate goal of the Akasha is to empower you in your own life. You know, we are the creators of our every day. Every thought, decision, action that we make creates new timelines. And so it is up to us to utilize that information or not. Um, but if anyone's in the Akashic records and they're telling you what to do, you are not in the Akasha. <laughs> it's just not what they're about. Yeah, some people like to describe it like a library. If I, if I remember descriptions of the Akasha. So it's a very interesting way of seeing things. So yeah, in a library, you also get to research. But this sounds like you get more than that. You get you actually have beings there who are helping you like even better than a librarian or a computer, right? <laughs> or an AI. It sounds like it's even better than all of that. So and you were describing that you get all the relevant information for the situation you're asking about and then you have to make up your own mind what you do with what you do. Sounds very cool, and not all of us experience that <laughs> like you do. And if I understand correctly, you've had many lifetimes before this lifetime in which you already were accessing the Akasha. So, yeah, you know, when when you think of the thought that we are all one, right? And then you're speaking of all these boundaries. It's very interesting because. The boundaries are part of the idea of separation. We need boundaries as long as we feel separate, right? So if we felt one, we wouldn't even have a thought of harming anyone or anything. So we wouldn't even need the boundaries. But obviously, we're not feeling that way yet. <laughs> so it's interesting to see how do you utilize this in you were saying it's very practical. It's just, would you like to describe some examples of how this comes through and what decisions you've made because of information that you got that you would have possibly not been able to make without the information from the Akasha? Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> there are so many examples. It's difficult to really pinpoint one, but I can say that um, one of the biggest decisions that I made with the Akasha was whether or not to move uh, for my partner and I, we had been living in a city for seven years and I really felt strongly that it was time to move. I had felt strongly for a few years that it was time to move. And, um, and this happened last year. And there were many things in place that we had to make decisions about. It was, it was, a, it was a big deal. Um, and I went back and forth because I was still building my business and there was concern and fear about whether or not, you know, it was really going to be aligned for me, whether it might hurt my business. 
I just didn't, there was a lot of unknowns and I wasn't fully sure of, of what it was. Um, and for me with this particular situation, the thing is, is that when you access your intuition, whether it's the Akashic records, whether you're connecting with your guides, whatever the case may be, when you're in a very emotional state, you're, you're not going to get good information. It's going to be here and hit or miss. Um, not necessarily that, you know, it's going to be inaccurate, but it definitely could be. Um, and so I had to go into the Akashic records many times <laughs> asking about this topic until I really was actually able to approach it from a neutral place where it didn't matter, you know, either way, what they shared with me. And once I was able to do that, and I think I had to go in probably four or five different times. And of course, once I was able to access that information from a neutral place, they just poured in, you know, they told me about the pros and the cons of us moving. They told me about the challenges. They told me why it would be very helpful. Um, they told me about, you know, the place that we were going, uh, the ways in which it would serve, the ways in which it would be more difficult. They gave me a really good understanding of what I was stepping into and helped to validate a lot of the things that I had intuitively known anyway. And so that was a, that was a really big one for me because that was, I mean, like we literally sold all of our stuff and hit the road and moved and we're bouncing around, you know, different Airbnbs. And it was, um, it was very helpful to say the least. Um, I also utilized the Akashic records in all of the things with my business in regards to they are the ones who have shared every workshop with me, every course with me. They down, you know, I download that information. They give it to me. Um, a really good example is uh, about two weeks ago now, I do believe, um, I had gotten into an argument with someone. And it was a pretty upsetting argument. And this person said to me, you know, like, oh, uh, now I know who you are. And in my wounding, I took this as like, I'm not a good person, right? Like I'm not really a good person at my core. And, um, and I went out the door and I went for a hike and I was hiking and I was praying and, you know, I was just saying to God, I was like, I know that I'm a good person. I know I'm a good person. I just have ugly parts. And when I said uh, like ugly parts, this whole workshop channeled down to me in regards to how I was meant to take this information and create like a mini series workshop course, three weeks. Like they gave me everything. They gave me the name. They gave me exactly what I'm supposed to do, exactly what we'll be doing in those sessions. And it was literally like I had walked into a room and there was a box sitting there with all of this information in it. And I was just looking down and there it was for me. And so that's actually a course that I'm going to be launching um, in January. But uh, those are some examples for you. <laughs> what would also be of interest is how much of the information that is compiled has to do with things that you already knew. Because that's something that's very, you know, when you speak of channeling, often one says that it comes through in your own words or in, or in concepts and or ideas that you've already encountered in your life or have already some knowledge about it. And then it deepens all of that. What, what is it for you? Yeah, we could, I mean, I, I would definitely agree with that in some respects for sure. I think that one of the reasons that especially me coming in as like the CEO of a marketing agency and coming from such a corporate background, the, you know, some of the things that really won me over. And I mean, like it took a while, it took like a year and a half of me consistently showing up, consistently seeing what was coming forward in my own readings, my client readings, but was the fact that I was sharing information that I had no idea of, no way to explain or describe or even know beforehand um, them channeling through in a way and speaking in a way that I don't speak normally. Um, you know, it was just like more and more and more, my trust grew and grew 
And then of course, when I would share this information with people and then they would, it would fully resonate with them or they would, you know, agree that it was aligned or whatever the case may be. It took some time for me to really grow my own trust in, in this craft and this connection. Um, I always tell folks, you know, people will ask me like, oh, you know, what do you think about so-and-so who doesn't believe in the Akashic records and, you know, is very cynical and very, um, uh, you know, um, what is the word? I can't think of it. You know, just has lots of questions, doesn't easily believe. And personally, I think that's awesome. I think that's good. When it comes to spirituality, ask questions, you know, utilize your curiosity. Like, don't be afraid to dig deeper. If it's something of substance, like, It'll be just fine, you know? And if if it's not, you will discover that in the way. There's no one modality that is for everyone and everything is going to be a little bit different. And we all experience our own gifts and abilities in different ways. Um, I think that, um, you know, when it comes to the information, it certainly has deepened what I have known, but... You know, like my clients, I've never met them before and I don't have conversations with them about their life and ask them all these questions before we dive into the records. It's like, here we go. This person's a stranger and the information that comes forward blows them away, you know, and that's not me, right? Like I'm just the middle channel for it. So it's kind of two pronged, you know, like there is information obviously that I know and because it's coming through me, there is that component of me in it. There always will be. But I am just that middle, you know, that, that connection in between. I'm just the channel. And it is my job to share whatever it is that comes forward with the person. Um, or it is my job to create whatever it is that they want to put out into the world. You know, that's that's what I'm doing. And this is where my guidance comes from. So I think that answered your question, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's a little difficult to imagine it just by hearing these descriptions. So, because it's very, you're bringing it in a very broad way. So if we want to narrow it down to, to specifics. Uh, that might be interesting if you go into a, an even more specific thing that maybe isn't a isn't something that something you can freely share that is no no issue not an issue but so that we can get a better grasp of it are you asking like for examples of of i mean i feel like i just gave you two so tell me more what you're looking for well Okay, maybe we should just do it. Like you said, you can do a look into countries or things like that. Um, maybe you want to look into the country I'm living in right now, for instance, as an example, so that people can get a feel for it or something else that you feel more comfortable with. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not going to open the Akashic Records right now. That would, I'm not in that space. I'm not prepared for that. Um you know, if you, if you want like more examples in regards to some of the things that clients come to me for, um, you know, one of the, the big things that I often see with clients is loved ones who've passed away, specifically parents at a very young age can really have a huge effect on someone's life and the way that a life unfolds. Um, one case in particular, she had been wrecked her entire life because her father left her at a very young age and she was really close with him. And she felt like he was her protector. She felt like he, you know, was there to ensure that everything in her life would go well. And I believe she was seven when he passed away, but the information that came through in regards to why he passed away and what happened in that situation was that he left because she was meant to become empowered on her own that if he would have stayed in the picture, she would have hid behind him, that she would not have expanded and done the things that she had in her life because he left. In addition, there's a lot, there was like grief from that situation that she had used to work with other people that had informed her work and deepened her work and helped her to become the type of person that she is. 
And so that was very healing for her. And still to this day, this was, I think back in 2020, actually, she was um, just one of the first people that I was doing practice readings with. And she still, you know, she follows all of my work because it was so healing for her to have a, such a better understanding in regards to what that relationship was about, what role her father played in her life and how it affected her life and how it set her up in her life. And so she was able to completely release all of that pain that she had been carrying her whole life just from coming into that understanding. Um, healing happens on a number of different levels with people, but it always begins with awareness. And oftentimes for people, when they have been carrying an enormous amount of grief um, or anger or these types of things throughout their entire life directed towards one person, just coming into the understanding of where, like what role those people were playing in that situation, how it helped them, the purpose that it served is very healing to that individual. And, you know, I've worked with clients who've gone through very traumatic experiences. And I can tell you that the majority of the time, this isn't always, of course, but the majority of the time, the people that hurt us the most in our life are actually the people that we are the closest to in our afterlife and in our in-between lives. And we give them those roles to come in and abuse us, to rape us, to kill us, to whatever the case may be, because we trust them the most. And I think it's, you know, this is again, going back to like the very first question you asked me, like how the Akasha has informed the way I look at the world that has greatly expanded how I look at my own difficult things that I went through as a child or as a teenager and, you know, some of the experiences that I had. So that um, coming into an understanding that these people are actually playing their part, they're playing their role, how they assisted me on my path, but then also, you know, the very violent ones. Those are usually the people that we are the closest to on the other side. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a better, I'm not someone who's just like, there's so many examples. It's difficult for me to know where to start. Have you come into contact with the ideas from A Course in Miracles? I am familiar with The Course in Miracles, and um, but I haven't like spent time reading it or studying it. Um, you know, Jesus is one of my main guides in this lifetime, and there was a point in time that the folk, the Course in Miracles folks actually almost hired me for marketing. They wanted to hire my agency. <laughs> this was many years ago, back in, I think, like 2016 or 17. Um, that was my first introduction to the Course in Miracles. But um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't dove in or, or spent much time with them. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting topic because the book is so full of many wisdom. And, and one of the, the images that's shared in the book sounds a lot like, like the ideas you could relate with when speaking of the Akashic record, the way you do. There's, there's this idea of this treasure, this treasure house. And the doors are kept open by the angels so that everyone can access everything. And there's always more. You know, the more people go and access it, the more there is. And so it sounds a lot like, so the angels are not there to keep you out, but to, to make sure that you can get in. Um, does that sound familiar with the ideas you were, it sounds somewhat like the ideas you were sharing about the Akasha. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, the Akashic records have, of course, been around since the beginning of time. And Akasha, the word Akasha, is a Sanskrit word, and it means ether, right? And the ether is that which connects all things in our universe. So it's like the in-between fibers, right, that keep everything together. Um, for a very long time on this planet, really up until only about 100 years ago, the Akashic records were only available to a select few. 
And of course you can, I mean, when, when we just think about how religion has been abused, um, we can understand why, right? In addition, of course, like being able to have the consciousness and the awareness um, to access the Akashic records, it just flat out was not available to the everyday person. Yet as our consciousness grew on this planet and, and has expanded and, you know, like being able to read is pretty, you know, pretty common now these days. Um, people can educate themselves, right? And so over the past 100 years, 150 years, it's been opening up and more and more people have been able to come in and access the Akashic Records and to receive this information for themselves. And I can tell you the mainstay, the core of what I teach and what I want to impart is that everyone has access to their own Akasha, their own wisdom within. You know, I love working with clients. I love leading my students, but I want them to do it for themselves. That is my ultimate goal. I'm not interested in them leaning on me forever. Every single one of us has access to the Akashic Records if that is something that we are drawn to. Not everyone's drawn to the Akasha, and that's fine, right? My big goal is really just to introduce people to their spirituality and to remind them that their spirituality is their own spiritual connection to the divinity that is within each and every single one of us. And so, you know, I think when I think of a house with the doors open and the angels welcoming people in, I think that that's like almost our own heart, right? Like bringing us back, drawing us back, drawing us back. But the Akasha is, it is the ether. It is the, it is the energy that holds all things together. And for those who are really drawn to it, it's absolutely available to them. I mean, I was the CEO of a marketing agency just because I did this for lifetimes. Like I had to learn how to do this. I showed up each and every day. I put in the time. I did trainings. I did all kinds of stuff. And, you know, yeah, it was, it was what was meant for me. But um, we all have access to these, to these beautiful modalities if it's something we're really drawn to. And this experience of being able to access when you get permission knowledge about another person, right, is very, very fascinating because that's part of many modalities, right? Whether you're, whether you're doing chakra healing techniques or other ways of helping each other. You get to know things about people because they give you permission that you wouldn't know otherwise just by looking at them or even just by speaking with them you might not know any of that so i think that's a uh, a very important aspect of our journey together of walking each other home as as of course miracle says we're walking each other home that we actually do have that capacity to help each other by seeing each other as well. That's one of the big things, like you were saying, for a client or for another person is to be seen and heard and understood and, and to be recognized in their power to make decisions of their own, right? And to be empowered in, in that. Yeah, I think that's a very important aspect of it all. I believe that it becomes religion when it takes someone's power away. You know, when when you say you must do this in order to get this information or you must act this way in order to, you know, understand this. And I... I'm all about empowering the person, empowering the self. The longer that I do this work, the more I am able, and I've always been able to look at people and see into the middle of who they are to understand what they're about. And now that I have been given so much depth to my perspective in regards to the way I look at people, it's very different what you see. And I don't want anyone to suffer. I don't want anyone to think less than of themselves. 
And yet these are still le lessons I'm learning myself, right? Like this is what we're doing. We're here growing and learning and expanding and perfection is impossible and also extremely boring. Like who would want that? You know, we didn't come here to try and be perfect, but we did come here to experience and to experience the widest of ranges in regards to emotions and experiences and people, places, things, whole nine yards. Um, but ultimately it's up to us in regards to what do we want to do with our life? How do we want to show up for ourselves? Do we want to empower ourselves? And I think that that's a big question because a lot of people talk about spirituality or they talk about, you know, healing and these types of things. And yet they're not taking responsibility for themselves and they're not really interested in doing that. They don't understand how important that is in the puzzle, you know, until we begin really truly taking responsibility for our experience, there's only going to be so much that can shift and there's only going to be so much that we can create because we're, we're giving our power away to another being or modality or whatever the case may be. Um, and the way that I view the world, I mean, even in my close relationship with God, I don't believe God wants anything from me. I don't believe God requires me to do anything at all. I know God loves me no matter what. And I know that my worth and value don't change regardless of how much I do or how much I don't do, how much I heal or I don't heal. I am eternal always, right? It's about my soul. My soul wants to experience these things. My soul wants to heal. My soul wants to, you know, go kick a ball. My soul wants to experience a bad relationship. My soul wants to find itself, right? Therefore, when we take responsibility for ourselves, we're drawing that power back to us and we can do incredible things from that place. Uh, thought from A Course in Miracles re resonates with that, is that we are all infinitely valuable in the mind of God. So yeah, there's nothing that could change that. Yeah, which I think is very beautiful. And it, it once again, like you said, it points to responsibility because your experience then is not censored. It's not like this higher being is censoring your experience and telling you you have to have this experience you have to have that you have to do this you have to do that there there is no limit to that love or that that um, welcoming of who you are so who you are and of course in miracles it says who we are is love so of course in miracles doesn't teach what love is because that's who we are so it's it's there to to help you um, recognize the presence of love in your life rather than than teaching you love because that's something that you already are. Okay, are there any questions at this point that uh, have come up? Let's, let's go a little more into the, the topic of God being love and love being unconditional and that and how how you were saying we, we need to take responsibility for our experience but on the other hand we also want help right and you have you you are explaining how you have accepted help from guides from your from your experience of the presence of love in your life like saying you, you have a relationship with God that is constant and is not something that drops away all the time or, or where you have any doubt about it. I thought was another thing that was very interesting because many of us have the question, is there God or not, uh, has come up in our lives. You said that was never a topic for you, but what God is like or 
and these things, and you were if come to some answers to that question. So maybe you want to share about that. About who God is? You were saying um, that you had questions about what is God like? What does he do? What, it, what, what role does he play in your life? And all these things, right? Because you said the presence or the knowledge that God is there was always there. That didn't change. Yeah, so I can only speak about my experience. And, you know, the thing is, is that I've always believed in allowing other people to have their own beliefs and have their own experiences. And I think it's really important to validate those. I don't think anyone is right or anyone is wrong. I can only speak into my own experiences and what is right or wrong for me or what feels most aligned. Um, but for me, I mean, those were questions I was asking when I was younger. And because I now have so many decades of living with God at my side and together, I feel like I have a good understanding of who God is in my life. And God to me is, is a guide. And absolutely someone that I want in my life on a consistent basis, in a daily basis. I want God's, uh, God's assistance to understanding my life, to making decisions, to filling me, helping me be the best that I can be, to, I mean, every part of my life I want God involved in. And that's my choice. You know, God doesn't need me to want that from God and God doesn't require me to want that from God. And, you know, in, in some ways it is a bit of a one-sided relationship, but you know, that's simply because I'm wanting a lot from God and God is just always here, always the same, always consistent. There's never, never once in my life, been a time when I needed God and God wasn't there immediately for me. God didn't open a door for me. God didn't fill me with love or hope or whatever the case was going on. And my ultimate loyalty will be to God. And yet I know at the same time that the life that I came in to live really, you know, like God didn't choose that for me. God didn't ask me to live this life. Um, at the same time, I know that, you know, if I chose to break away from God at any point in time, that that connection would not change in regards to how God treats me. I, yeah, God is just a guide and God loves us so much that it's like, he doesn't care. He doesn't care what we do. He doesn't care what's going on because God is God and God will always stay the same. And that is the true definition of love. As far as I'm concerned. I think that, you know, if we as humans and beings are also love, then it's simply because our core is God. And, you know, we're all different fragments of God and we have all spurled out in our own souls, our own paths. God experiences life through us. And that is a lot of God's enjoyment and also fascination and interest. That's how the whole thing just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning is that there's never ending experiences here, but God is eternal. And that's also why we are eternal beings as well, because that's our core. And not until we rejoin with God at the end will, I don't even know that there will ever really be an end, quite frankly, but I guess we'll, we'll, we'll find out, we'll figure out. Um, yeah. I've only got about five more minutes, just FYI, before I need to move on to an appointment I've got. So, Henry, did you have a question because you put up your hand? Or was that not because you wanted to say something? Well, if that's the case, then we'll start wrapping up, right? Is there a question I didn't ask that you would have liked me to ask that you would like to answer? Not really. Um, 
I would say if folks have any questions about the Akashic Records, I welcome them. Come connect with me online, AnnaHendricks.com. You can find me on Instagram and threads. I have a podcast where you can listen to monthly Akashic forecasts in addition to a number of different channeled Akashic readings and learn more about the Akashic Records. I teach workshops and courses and you know, I'm, I'm here to be a resource. So even if I don't have answers for you, then I could probably send you in a direction where you might find them and or introduce you to someone who might be better able to assist you than I can. So feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm here. So, so I, I'm sorry that I um, don't understand all the uh, stuff with uh, Zoom and these bod- uh, podcasts. And so, Anna Hendricks, I'd like to ask you a little question about your pronoun. Like, uh, you chose to call uh, God He, and I, I, I know that that's a um, like. If I look at your 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 image on this screen, you're a young, beautiful woman, and. It, it kind of uh, fascinates me. Why <laughs> why would you choose that pronoun? Why why not call it it or even even they or we or I? Like pl- please help me understand where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not muted, right? Uh, okay, perfect. <laughs> It's a great question and um, and one I usually explain when I'm when I'm talking. But, um, you know, for me, it's a it's it's a personal it's a personal choice. I really can't explain it to you other than God has always felt like a father to me. And because we have such a close relationship, there's no way that I couldn't assign a pronoun. They them just doesn't it, it just doesn't resonate with me. It's really that simple. And I understand that, you know, some people prefer it or her, or, you know, I'm, I'm cool with whatever people want to do for themselves. For me, it just feels most resonant. And that's really all I can say. Um, so, so you kind of missed my question. I'm, I'm really, really asking you, Anna Hendricks, really, really personally, why he, you you didn't answer the question, but it, uh, I'm I'm not trying to force you into some kind of answering. But why he? And, and I, I, you know, uh, I'm I'm kind of a confrontational fellow, and I, I'm getting used to my role in this world. But um, you're not answering my question, or 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 am I kind of stupid here? I don't think you're stupid. And I think I did answer your question. For me, it's just always been he. He's always felt like a father to me. And that's just been my experience. And always has felt like a father to me since I was a kid, since I was, since I can remember. So another question that I have is, you were speaking well, and about. I've, I've I've really got to I've really got to like we had an hour and a half kind of timed off for this, and I've got another appointment on the back end of this. Okay, so then either we do a quick a quick thing about it or not. You know, I'll just um, line it out for you. You were speaking of how there's people who oh, you're good. Um, want right or wrong make things right or wrong and how that's not the way you go about things or not the way the Akasha works. And so uh, and you were speak you were using the term religious religion as as an explanation for that rigidity or that way of because yes, I, I know there's many religious groups that say we're right and you're wrong. But I think it's more like a I mean, in A Course in Miracles, we speak of separation thinking and, and the one where we are joined, thinking that joins us or makes us one. So I, I don't know if, if that resonates with you or not, but anyways, I, I wanted to say, say something about that. Yeah, so I think that 
one of our biggest invitations at this point in time on the planet is to step outside of any kind of polarized thinking, you know, any sort of like, yes, no, right, wrong, Republican, Democrat, you know, black, white, like any of these types of thinking. And to be honest with you, like for me, it's always kind of felt like a waste of time. Not that I don't have my own personal ways in which I view the world. And of course I have opinions. And of course I think sometimes like that's right or that's wrong. I'm human, right? That's a very normal part of, I mean, like we're, Earth is a 3D planet. It's it's a polarized planet. Like she literally wanted to be a polarizing planet so that we could experience the full range of our emotions. Like if you think about love, if all you ever knew was, was love, then you wouldn't know what hate is. And if you ever, you know, like in just knowing hate, you would never know what love is. Understanding and experiencing both sides are what give us such a rich, rich, deep experience here on planet Earth. And so that polarization is actually very helpful for us in determining what we feel about certain things. But at the same time, being able to step outside those parameters, I think, is really important. And even when I was a young girl and I was a Christian, I would have a lot of people who would want to enter into arguments and discussions with me about God and want to say, like, you know, whatever about Christianity. And the bottom line is, I feel really good about what I believe. I feel really good about where I'm at. But I could never tell anyone else what is right or wrong for them. That's their decision. You know, I'm not them. I'm not experiencing them. And it's not my role to be this person who's like, this is right or this is wrong. And so for me, I really try and step outside of that stuff. You know, I, I have a lot of distaste for religion in general, for laws and rules that are not operating, you know, for the equitable, you know, the, uh, for all of us, I should say. Um, and Yet I understand that this is the planet we're on. This is the energy that we live in. And so, and those things are very much playing a role. We've got a, we've got a quite a ways as a, as a humanity to go before we actually can elevate out of that. And whether or not earth will ever fully elevate out of that, I honestly don't know. So thank you for having me in here sharing your thoughts and your experience and examples from your life from your feelings about that and what it has done for you and what it can how it can serve anyone interested in this journey so thank you so much and please share the word about the podcast about the what we're doing here and how many different people have been on the podcast and how, how that's a fascinating way of walking each other home. So thank you for everything. Blessings to you all. And if you want to be a guest on the podcast, any of you, please feel free to reach out to me. If you know someone you feel would be a great guest, you can connect them with me. And yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for supporting this podcast and making it uh, a joined journey rather than only me here <laughs> and my guests. So thank you so much. And till next time. Bye-bye.